Welcome, Aaron Chapman, to Wealth Matters Podcast. How are you? Doing very well, man. How about yourself? Good, thank you. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. You know, I appreciate the opportunity to come in and share with another audience. It's um, to me, it's a blessing to have people out there like yourself. They're putting out great content and trying to help others by getting the word out of how they can improve their financial situation, their personal situation, you know, you know their their family situation. All these things because literally all of that wraps into what I do, and I just appreciate the opportunity to share it again. I appreciate it, uh, Aaron. And I remember whenever we chatted, I enjoyed our uh, conversation about a bit about business or finances or even personal development. So I'm looking forward to this discussion today. So uh, can you tell us what do you do? So I finance real estate investors purchasing most of the time turnkey properties. Now they purchase any, really any property in the residential world, whether it be single family, duplex, triplex, fourplex. Right. And I help a lot of people that are going beyond that because I have contacts all over in the industry. So me and my team, we finance those homes. That's how we bread our table. We get those, that financing complete like any bank would. But the difference is we, we don't have all the restrictions that you're going to have in the banking world because we just follow the regular guidelines. Most of banking folks love to put a right. lot of what they call overlays on it. Yep. Pr- what they believe is protecting themselves from a potentially risky endeavor. And as far as what we can see, the real estate investor is not near as risky as the home buyer who has to pay for it themselves. The investor is not paying for it. The tenant is. So exactly. we've found a niche that works awesome for us. Yeah. And I have used your services personally as well. So yeah, I can, I can vouch for it. So how and why did you end up in mortgage industry? <laughs> Well, that, that's, that's an interesting story. I was, I was at an event recently where the guy who was the main speaker at it was talking about when he owned his mortgage company back before the crash. Oh, and okay. he made a comment that people get in the mortgage industry because they can't get a job anywhere else. And the whole crowd <laughs> laughed. And, and it's true, though. So let me, to kind of give you the, the background, I, was, I grew up on a cattle ranch. Oh, and wow. I graduated high school halfway through my senior year. And I went from there to work in the oil fields of Wyoming as a welder and a welder's helper in the field. And then I went from there to running heavy equipment. I I, I drove truck. And then I worked in the mines in northern New Mexico. Well, I had a wife and infant son in Arizona. And I would go to northern New Mexico as a 10-hour drive with my dad. And we would work in the mines. And we lived there on site, uh, really just down in the canyon in the cabin close to the mine. And we would come back and forth every 13 shifts. So we'd work 13 shifts on underground, drive and drip. And you're drilling and loading up the air, the, uh, all the holes that you drilled into the, into the rock with explosives, step around the corner, blow it wow. up, clean it out, support the ground, and keep advancing what they call the heading or in, in, what they, in what they call the drift instead of a tunnel. And so 13 shifts, and we take six days off, 13 shifts on, six days off. Well, after a, a, a little bit of time, they shut down the project, and I was one of the – first ones to get laid off. So I came back to Arizona and I thought I would easily find a job. I had an awesome resume from, you know, cattle ranching to, you know, welding, <laughs> heavy equipment, working in the mines. Right. I couldn't find a job to save my life. I was, wow. it was, it got to a point where I literally broke down to the extent of take, trying to get a $10 an hour truck driving job to haul landscape rock and just dump it on people's yards so they can do their landscape. And I went there and it was my last ditch effort and they shot me down saying I was overqualified and you know, they knew that I, I get a different job somewhere else the second I had a chance. Right. right. So I'm sitting in their parking lot, literally shedding tears and I'm leaving their area and driving home. And it was, it was across town. This was downtown Phoenix area. I live in the far East Valley. So it's about a 20 minute drive. And I had a coupon to get diapers for my son because we couldn't afford diapers at the time. We were that broke. And then my gas light turns on. So now I'm almost out of fuel. So I go to the closest grocery store I could find that had a fuel station. I just pulled up to whichever. Pulled up there, ran my debit card. I got a decline. I couldn't even get a gallon of gas, which was under a dollar at that time. So I started walking the parking lot for a couple of hours. And I found enough change in the parking lot to get enough gas to get two gallons of gas so I can make it home. I went into the grocery store, found the diapers that corresponded with the coupon, bought them. I'm walking out and I end up face to face 
with a guy who used to do all the dispatch work at a company I dug swimming pools for a couple years before or a year before. Well, he asked me what I was doing. I explained my scenario. He said, let me take you and your wife to dinner. He got a gift certificate because this is before gift cards from uh, Red Lobster, took me and my wife to dinner the next night, explained the mortgage industry, gave me a business card for a manager at a broker shop and made an introduction. So I started the next week in December of 1997 as a telemarketer, and that's how it all started. Wow, that, that is a great story. Um, I wouldn't and it hasn't been easy. It's been a little <laughs> touch of hell ever since. Uh, I believe you. So do you personally also invest in real estate? Um, I have properties in five states. So Arizona, Arkansas, Alabama, Missouri, and uh, Georgia. Oh, so you're like me. Five? You're all over. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm scattered. Yeah, I'm scattered. So, um, and, and I want to focus this podcast because you have seen so many investors work with you. I heard you have done hundreds of tra thousands of transactions by this time. So I want to see what have you seen which is working and what have you seen which do not, does not work for most of the investors. So can you list things which an investor should not do when he or she is trying to grow their real estate portfolio or even after they have grown their real estate portfolio, what, which things they should keep in mind? Because even after you, know, you become an experienced investor, you still keep making some mistakes which you should not. Well, the first thing is don't make the same mistake. <laughs> I see a lot of people keep making the same yes. damn mistake. And it's, it is such an easy thing to say, right? right? So it's much easier said than broken road, right? right. You know, it's, that's, cattle, that, that's rancher talk for, you know, easier said than done. <laughs> you know, um, anybody can say, I can ride that horse, but it's a whole different thing to jump on an unbroke horse and try and get that sucker to stand right. still. So people tend to continue to travel down the same road over and over and over again. Now, hold definition of insanity. But to, to talk about the, the new investor for a moment, the, the greatest mistake I see people make is trying to time the market. So like, well, I'm, I'm holding out till the interest rates get better. I'm holding out till the, till the market does in and the, in the, in the, trying to find the best market for the best price because nice. Kiyosaki says you make your money on the buy, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, well, that's the, great, the problem. Yeah, I, I would say that's a key takeaway from the podcast. And I, I see the same thing, but I'll let you continue. Yeah, you can't time the market. No one can. You can't. <laughs> the only time a person knows when the bottom is, is when they're on the way back up. So I kind of look at, I, I, I used to, I, I don't watch much sports, but I used to play football in high school and I loved it. I was a defensive end. I had a blast. I was a small, one of the smallest guys on the field, but one of the fastest guys on the field. Wow. So I had a really good time with it. Well, one of the things that, that um, I look at this whole thing is trying to time a market is like trying to sit on the bench most of the game and go in only for the best play. You never know when the best play is until yeah. the best play is over with, right? Oh, you don't even know that until the game is over with. So it's impossible. Well, it's, and the reason it's a great analogy is because it's impossible to time it unless you're in it. Yeah. So I tell everybody, get in the market now. If you're trying to get uh, to, to find the best time, the only way that a person says, I bought properties at the best time of the market is because they were already buying property anyway, and they just right. happened to buy it that day. And they can say, listen, I bought it right there in that window of time. I happened to buy three properties. Right. So that's one of the main things to tell everybody. Get in the market, start moving it, and start doing what you're supposed to be doing. The other mistake everybody does is they act like a consumer. Even seasoned investors do. They're being led around like a bunch of sheep going over a ledge so what for do what you people mean by, are advertising. What do you mean by acting as a consumer? So Amazon and, well, and uh, Walmart are doing awesome, right? Because right, they yeah. sell products cheap and efficiently, yep, right? Of course. So people get sucked into where am I going to find the cheapest rate? Where am I going to find the cheapest house yeah. that's going to make me the cash flow? Where am I going to find the cheapest this or the cheapest that? And what they fail to realize is that some of these things are the minimal end of it. So let's talk, let's talk like cash on cash return, right? Mm -hmm. People shop these pro formas like mad. Yep. They will compare seller to seller based on their pro formas. Well, mm -hmm. I'm dealing a lot with the professor of, a, of accounting at Kennesaw State University. He has me actually coming out this, uh, this fall to speak to his students and we're actually working on changes to his curriculum together. Nice. And we're talking about um, 
that aspect there, he says that the word pro forma is Greek for made up because none of that stuff is accurate. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So what I tell people you need to do, rather than trying to shop and sort through pro formas, sort through the people. Get to know who you're dealing with. Is this a person you can deal with or is it not? I've had many people ask me about different turnkey providers and say, well, what is their performance like? Or what is their rehab like? And all this stuff. I say, guys, I can't speak to that. I can speak to the man. I sat face to face with that man. I've seen the look in his eyes. I've seen how he's treated people. And that is a good, solid, honest person that will make it right and do the best he can. Regardless of the circumstances, all you can ask is for the best. Yeah. Circumstances will sometimes even make the best situation bad. Yeah, and so, isn't, isn't real estate about people? It's, it's about networking. It's about building relationship in the end, right? If you, if you find the right person to work with, you know, go, go with that person. You know, go with your gut feeling. Exactly. You, each real estate investor has to wrap their head around the fact that they are the CEO of their real estate investment firm, period. And anybody else they bring in, whether it be a turnkey provider or a lender or, or a property manager, needs to be somebody that they want at their board table as a trusted advisor. If that person is not something they would trust for all their advice and their involvement and be, think that they're getting the best information to make decisions on, then don't let that person in, regardless of what the, how awesome their pro forma is or how awesome their quote is. It's right. all like, it, that's like a movie trailer. We've all been to movies that sucked because the trailer looks so good, right? Yep. <laughs> that's all it is, is advertising. Everything they give you is advertising. You've got to know the man and you've got to know, or the woman, and you've got to know that that individual you can trust to give you the data that you need to make the right decision. And when you make the decision, and if it doesn't work out, you need to own up to that, that you made the decision. You're the CEO, yes. you take the blame. Quit yep. pointing the fingers. It's nobody else's fault but yours. The second you take ownership of your life and your business, all of a sudden it starts to flourish. But, the, but if you continually try to point the finger, you will have nothing but problems in your life. Yep. No, you, you are the decision maker. You got to know that. It, it, precisely. You got to know that. So number one is you get the right people at your board table, the right people to work with you. Number two, you pick the right property. If that's a property you don't think will be rentable, and if the property has nothing but problems according to your inspections, spend the money, get the inspections and the reinspections, then don't buy the dang property. Right. Never get to a sunken cost fallacy where you spent, well, I've already spent money on an inspection, I've already spent money on appraisal, I just need to close. No, because all you're doing is open yourself up for more problems. Yeah. Walk away, count that as money spent that was good money spent because it kept you away from a problem. I too have fallen victim to that. I've fallen victim to several things. I bought a property even I knew damn well not to buy it. Yeah. And, I, and, and I still did because I needed to deploy that capital. I figured I could make it work. One of something, I sunk another 10 grand into the damn thing after I bought it when it was supposed to be a turnkey. Why did I, why did I sink 10 grand into it? Because I didn't have the inspector go back out. Yeah. I made a mistake. So I tell every single client, spend the money up front so you're not spending 10 times more later. I've heard one guy say, there's an investor I worked with quite a bit, his name was Tom, Tomas. He said, every time I tried to save a buck, I spent five. <laughs> that right there, that, that right is so there true. is worth every single bit of this podcast is that statement. Yeah, that, that is so true for every investor. And I'm pretty sure, you know, listeners are right now or whenever they're listening to this, they'll be nodding their head, right? Because they have all been prey to this thing, right? They have all seen, uh, been through this. And, and uh, I was nodding my head because same exact thing. I had to deploy my cash. I ended up buying a property which I should not have. But yeah, don't repeat the yeah, same thing again. <laughs> You, I agree with you. There's a thousand people right now listening to this and nodding their head and want something they're going to do in the next, in the next probably week. They're going to shop somebody for price. Yep. <laughs> because the, they're going to, they're going to try and save a buck. Let me tell you something, especially let's talk interest rate for a second. Every bank in the world loves to use interest rate as a motivator to get people to finance. Correct. Yep. In fact, people are refinancing probably every four or five years, six years, maybe. Yep. Exactly. Right. And they're doing that because the banks are like, Hey, the rates just went down. You're going to save a hundred dollars on your payment. So let yeah. me ask you a question. Do you know what the rate of inflation is right now? It's less than 2% ish. It should be about 2% or so. 
that is according to the government, right? They say it's yeah. 2%. Yeah. Well, that yeah. is their CPI. That's the CPI, right? The core, core production. That's index. true. Well, they take out certain important things in that. They take out taxes, they take out food costs, and they take out energy costs. Uh, when was the last time you paid less taxes per dollar you made? Nope. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't Never, know. Never, right? It's only gone up. <laughs> only nope. gone up. When was the last time you went to a grocery store, bought the exact same things, and spent less money? Nope. Never. <laughs> when was the last time you spent, you, it cost you less per kilowatt hour of electricity or less per gallon of water on your utility bill? Never. Never. Those things go up significantly. That's why they took it out. So if you go to That's... a website called shadowstats.com, as in shadow statistics, they add that stuff back in. So if you go into that website across the top, you'll see uh, alternate data. You click on that drop down. You go into the, um, into the inflation t uh, charts, and you can look at the charts. When they add it back in, it shows us at about 5.5% inflation. Wow. That and I remember you gave living... me this website when we chatted about three, four months before ago. So, yeah. Yeah. So you've taken a look at it. So 5.5% inflation. So when we're talking about that, that means that the dollar is losing its value at a pretty value. rapid yes. rate, right? Yes. So if the dollar is losing its value that quickly, we get to raise our rents on our, on our properties to pace inflation, correct? I think the national average right now is 3.6%. Um, is Mm -hmm. well, let's say you're only raising it 3% per year. So if you're raising rates at 3% per year, right? And if you're, you're charging a thousand dollars a month, what is 3% of a thousand? 300. That's 10%. Yeah. The, I mean, I, sorry, that's uh 30%. It would actually be oh, 30, 30 bucks. 30 bucks. 30 bucks. Sorry. 30 bucks. Not a problem. No, no apology. So $30 a month. Not real sexy. People don't get all, they don't jump out of bed for 30 bucks anymore. No. That's going to buy you a latte and a half a sprinkled donut. So $30 though, but you're making $200 a month in cash flow on it. And if your cash flow just went up by $30 a month and you're making 200 a month in cash flow, now it's 230. Your cash flow all actually went up by 15%. That's kind of sexy, right? That is, yeah, that is sexy. So you now get to do a compound increase of 15% per year gain on your previous year's gain, and it keeps growing, correct? Yep. That's a potential. I'm not saying it's going to happen every time, but that's a potential. Right. Now, do they, do, does the, do they get to raise the payment that you make on the 30-year fixed loan to pace inflation? No. No, they don't. It stays the same. But yeah. we know that the dollar that they're receiving from you is losing its value at a rate faster than 5.5% because the cost of living is going up 5.5%, not the dollar losing it. The dollar is losing right. it faster than that because the cost of living keeps increasing the way it is. It's a, different, yeah. it's a different equation. I'm still trying to work that equation out. I'm actually working yeah. with the students at Kennesaw State to come up with the equation that will properly illustrate the dollar's value. Oh, wow. But when, we're, when we see that doing what it's doing, you're paying them back less and less and less at a dynamic, dynamic decline as you are increasing your income and you get to keep the spread, right? Yep. So who's screwing who? <laughs> the real estate investor who leverages the property, a good property with a good team, and keeps that 30-year fixed note and pays it off slowly, not, in, not accelerating the payment, they're taking advantage of inflation. They're the yep. only asset class on the planet that I know of that takes advantage of inflation. Yeah. Now, to illustrate exactly how powerful this is, I was on a different podcast and I had mentioned this inflationary thought process to the, um, to the, um, the, the host. And he stopped me about three quarters of the way through and he goes, dude, we got to go backwards to that inflation thing you talked about earlier. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, he says, sorry, I hadn't listened to you for the last 10 minutes. I just let you go on while I did some research. And I found that the value of a dollar in 1930 was basically, he just asked me, he goes, what do you think is the value difference in a 1930 dollar versus a dollar in 2019? I told him, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a basis of, of numbers to figure that out. Well, he said that he looked at it, and it, from what he can see in multiple different places, that the dollar's buying power in 1930 was equal to $220 buying power today. Well, I'm not surprised. Yeah, and, and I wasn't either after I thought for a second. At first I was, I'm like, there's no way. 
I got to think of, wait a minute, a dollar a day's wages was probably pretty good back in 1930. Exactly. $220, $220 in, in wages today is pretty good, right? Yeah. Unless you're in the Bay Area, and then that's Providence. <laughs> that, that it's 440. But, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, it has to be. Yeah, it's even a bigger, bigger <laughs> difference. Dumb. But if that's the case, if that's the metric we're working off of, meaning in 90 years, we lost, the dollar lost 220 times its value over 90 years. And we use that as a benchmark to figure this out. A 30-year fix will fit in that 90 years three right. times. Three times. Right? Yeah. So we take the 220 divided by three. That means 73.33. That means in the time it takes you to pay off this loan with your tenant's money, the dollar will lost 73.33 times its value over that period of time. That's crazy. How crazy is that? So what I tell people is don't ever make the mistake of paying off your loan if you don't have to. The only time you want to refinance and pull that in and pay off that loan is when you're stripping equity back out of it to redeploy in the market. This whole thing of trying to pay it off earlier or put more money down to get a better rate is nothing but a farce to get you to come to the table and spend your money. Don't do that. Exactly. And, then and I are, know it's hard. Yeah, and you're starting the cycle that. again. That's the, another thing. You're starting the 30-year cycle again. You pull the... You know, you pay for it, you want to pay off, and then you are going to start again paying for 30 more years. Uh, it's unless you're and right. It's, and it's not, exactly. And it's not a, not a bad thing to start the cycle again if you're stripping capital out of it. Right. That's not if a bad you're thing. Taking advantage of that cap, yeah, equity. Yep. Exactly, because you're getting new money to stretch out for 30 years on the payback. That's not a bad thing. But it's when you just refinance to get a lower rate and a lower payment is not smart. Because the banks that are saying do this refinance is because the first five years is front loaded with interest exactly. and they just charge <laughs> fees, right? Yeah. Well, if you do it again, you're paying straight interest again and they're not paying down the principal hardly at all. They're not, they're just getting a ton of money from you on interest and they're getting your fees to do it again. Yep. People who keep churning it within the first five years, it's not smart. I'm sorry, guys. It's just not smart. I totally agree. <laughs> So that, that it just a, makes you a consumer. You're being suckered into consumer thinking. That was a great advice again. So um, what would you say an investor should do while scaling up his or her real estate investments? Yeah, that is a very, very solid question. Um, I would say the best thing that they can possibly do is get right with what they want their time frame to be. Many people are investing most of the time is because they want to retire, right? Right. Saying, well, I'm scaling up because I want to retire. I want to get out of my job. Yep. Well, that, I had that same thought process. I always thought I'll be retired by 45. Well, I'm turning 45 in just a few months. And looking back on what my mindset was when I was thinking that way, you know, I had a lot of assets. Then the crash happened. I got in a motorcycle accident. I woke oh. up in the hospital after the crash, and I had pretty much lost two and a quarter million. I was pretty much vaporized at that point. Ooh. And then I had to start rebuilding again. And now I'm rebuilt back up to a pretty solid position and I have a great setup with my kids being involved, the whole works. And now I'm thinking, I'm not definitely not looking to retire at 45. In fact, now when I come to the grave, I'm coming in hot. There's no reason for me to be retired because I have a whole different perspective now. I use the revenue I'm generating to generate more than just the retirement for me. So the second I go into retirement means I am of zero value to anybody. Oh, yes. But I'm... Yeah, and, and I don't do anything for the world at all. But if I stay in this game, I keep getting better at what I do. I keep helping investors to build their business and do it properly and give them insights to consider before they make decisions. And then put out good content because I'm starting a YouTube channel. I've got books right now with a publisher that I'm, I'm just doing the finalizations on. I've got all these other things that I'm working on that, uh, that are going to be built to help other people. Makes me feel like I matter at some point. So why would I walk away from that? Is it hard? Yes, it's hard. Is it, is it something that you always enjoy? No, some of it really sucks. Yeah. But I like the feeling that I get when I can look out over everything that's going on and say, there, and I get these responses back to people or these emails or these follow-up calls and they just tell me how things have changed in their life because of our involvement or our willingness to be blunt and saying, no, don't do that. It'd be easier to say, yeah, do it because then it calls on the deal and I get paid. I don't give a crap about getting paid anymore. I bread my table just fine. I don't need to close a deal to pay my, to, to feed my family. What I need is people to be successful. That's, that's amazing. So um, 
because you speak with so many investors day in, day out. Can you share some character or personality traits of a successful investors? What have you seen? Maybe if you were able to analyze some of those. <laughs> the biggest character trait is, is a person who's willing to learn. You know, a person who's willing to take the time to understand what they're getting into and then learn from the mistakes. And learn from the wins too. You gotta learn from the wins. What, yes. what made it what made it work, right? What made it there, work? There's yep. a have you seen the uh, the movie called uh, Rounders with Ed Norton and um, and Matt Damon? No, I have not. I'm gonna put it on my list now. You gotta see it. I made my son watch it when he turned 18. There's a lot of swearing in it and stuff like that, but it has a lot of good information for life. And one of the things he talked about. And she quoted supposedly this guy, Jack King, in a, a book called um, Confessions of a Winning Poker Player. Yes. And the, the saying went something along the lines of, um, you know, it, people, it, people don't recall all the, all the pots that they may have won, right? All the, mm -hmm. all the big wins that they had at the table. But they do always recall with remarkable accuracy the big failures that they had. Yes. And I, I recall those things very, very well. You know, so, I mean, just to kind of <laughs> illustrate, you know, to illustrate something, um, sixth grade, my parents, uh, not sixth grade, six years old, my parents put me in first grade at a Pentecostal school. I never went to kindergarten because we were staying in the first grade. And they were teaching us the alphabet. And in teaching us the alphabet, they remember the film strips, you get a beep and you flip over the next frame. Uh -huh. Well, in teaching the alphabet, they had these little nursery rhymes or limericks associated with a, uh, with a film strip. And we got to the letter M. And it's about this mule named Milton. It was Milton the mule made a mistake. As he read a map, he walked in a lake. And had this little cartoon mule walking down a trail, looking at a map and walking right into the water. Well, even at six years old, I was one of those people that make up things, right? And yeah. I changed the wording from Milton walking into a lake to pissing in a bucket. <laughs> well, my teacher, my teacher is married to the pastor who is also our principal. Oh. He grabbed, she grabbed my ear and the ear of the little girl next to me who laughed about it took us straight to the principal's office and had me recite it to him. And he was a big man. <laughs> well, after I recited that, he reached down to his next to his desk and pulled, uh, brought up an aircraft aluminum briefcase, dialed in the code and ceremoniously popped it open and showed me the interior, which was padded and cut out to hold his paddle. So he made a stand up, turn around and he whooped our butts with that paddle. Yeah. yeah. Then when I got home, my dad put my butt for having to go yeah, to the principal's office. Some more. <laughs> now, Alpesh, how many letters are in the English alphabet? That's a great question. 26. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I had to Google it. I thought it was 24. 26. Uh, I'm, just, no, I'm just kidding. How many letters, how many letters do you think I remember the nursery rhyme for? <laughs> I don't know. Just one. Oh, just one is because M. I got my ass beat for it. M. The letter M. I have no uh, idea what any of the other ones were. Right. It's a funny and so the story. reason I tell that story, even that story, you know, the, the reason that story makes sense is because it's easy for us to learn from, for our mistakes. From failure, yes. 40, exactly, I'm nearly 40 years later. And I still remember the one, you know, but what, you could think of all the great things that we've done, all the big wins, all the awesome stuff, man. My junior year in high school, the opening football game, I got more sacks than anybody the entire season. I took that quarterback's head off. There wasn't a quarterback that stepped on that field that I didn't take advantage of. But I remember one mistake I made on a play. Yeah. Why don't I learn? Why don't I remember the other stuff? So people need to start figuring out where did they make, where did they do the right thing and continue to keep doing those right things. Yes. Yeah. So it, we, we are. Yeah. Make a note of it. Preacher, we're, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, if it's working, make a note of it and, and, and keep doing, right? It, it's working. And, and I have made the same mistake and most of us do, right? Because I feel like, oh, you know, I, I failed at this and I'm going to remember that forever and try not to repeat. But it should be also other way around. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with staying away from treacherous ground. We always want to do that. But we need to, we need to figure out the right things because we're creatures of habit. So we need to make good habits and become their slave. Do the right things all the time instead of now and again and being successful now and again, but then always thinking about the wrong thing. Forget the wrong stuff. Just get the right stuff wired in your head. There's a, there's a Dr. Joe Dispenza out there 
that yes. talks about these things, getting the right thoughts going. Yes. And, and you can probably put that in your notes. I'll shoot you the, uh, the YouTube uh, link yes, for that I, talk I, I about wearing your brain. Him. Yeah, you, you told me about him about six months ago. So I have been awesome. following you. It's, it's awesome, actually. I, I, I've been enjoying his work. So that, that right there is a couple of, just a couple nuggets on what a person should be doing. And there's nothing wrong with learning from your mistakes. You absolutely need to learn from your mistakes. But learn from your wins, too. Yeah. And pull that, dissect those and form good habits with that. That's awesome. Those are some of the golden nuggets from the podcast as well. So how can my listeners reach out to you, Aaron? Uh, best is my website, AaronBChapman.com. B is in boy, uh, which not my middle name. It's, you know, but it's A-A-R-O-N-B-C-H-A-P-M-A-N.com. So if you I, see a guy with a, lo- with a long beard sitting in front yes. of a cabin, you found the right place. Yep, and I will put that in the show notes as well. I thoroughly awesome. enjoyed this uh, conversation and I w- I'm going to bring you back again uh, when you have launched your YouTube channel. But look Awesome. Up- well, and, and what I'd love to be able to do is eventually be able to get you out there for one of the, uh, the YouTube events so we can film that. We also make an audio of it and you can put it out on your podcast. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, sir. Well, what are the things that we failed to cover? I think we covered everything other than the last thing I wanted to talk about was what's your most favorite finance or business book? I've got three that I really, really like. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get down to one. Okay. One that I think is, was the most life-changing book I've ever had in front of me uh, was The Master Key System by Charles Hammond. Oh, that's amazing. That That book is awesome. And I, I should remind the listeners that they also have the videos on Amazon Prime. So if you are an Amazon customer, you can listen to and watch the videos. That I, I enjoyed the book as well as the videos. Yeah, and the one thing I'll caution everybody, if you decide to do it, and you should, you should get that book. Don't just read it. Do exactly what it says. There's 24 chapters there that used to be a, um, a correspondence course. You'd write in, you'd pay your money, he'd send you a letter, and that letter had the first, like, the first chapter in it. Then you'd have a week where you oh. read that same chapter every day for a week. Every single day for a week, you read that and you do the exercise, the mental exercise at the end to prepare your thinking to be accurate. And then the next letter would come the next week and you would do that one. So there's 24 weeks it takes you to get through this. You, and you need to dedicate yourself to doing exactly what it says. <clears throat> and it changes your life. It literally does. I've got four books right now with the publisher because of this. Thanks for sharing uh, about the book as well as your words of wisdom. Well, it is an absolute life changer. If people will just follow it too often. I hear people, Oh yeah, I read that book. It's like, well, how did you read it? Well, I just sat down and read it. Well, you didn't do it then. You didn't read it right. This is not a read through. This is a, this is a long-term exercise and it's literally a life exercise. I'm on my fourth time through it. I wow. keep starting over, but I changed the exercise a little bit because once you do that exercise enough, the exercises actually become more and more intense till you get to a point where now you just have the ability to, to uh, work your mind. You know, once you have that ability to, to direct your mind where it needs to direct, you don't need to go through the little exercise anymore. You need to just spend the time building your future. That's awesome. So I, I need to do that the same thing then because I just read through it. <laughs> yep, then you need to get, get that book out. And start from the beginning and do it exactly that. You know, do uh, do uh, lesson one. Take a week to do all of lesson one. Then start again with lesson two and then lesson three. And it, it, you will be, you'll see an amazing difference in your life if you follow along. Perfect. I'm going to do that. Kane, I really, right appreciate, on, man. I really appreciate you being here. I thoroughly enjoyed it as well as I, whenever I chat with you, I always learn a thing or two. <laughs> Well, uh, I think that I am, my, my shelf life will be used up the second I'm not able to give something new to consider. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Aaron. Have Thank you, sir. Day.